I'd like to call to order the special joint meeting of the Board of Directors and the Citizens Advisory Committee for Tuesday, September 12, 2017. And uh, please rise and join Alex in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Termination of a <clears throat> Director Flown. Here. Director Hunt. Here. Director Luckman. Here. Director Unger. Here. Mr. Johnson is absent from excused, uh, excused absence. There's four members present. You have a quorum. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I make a motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any other opposed? I have questions. Okay. Um, I, I'm concerned, I guess, about a joint meeting between the CAC and the board for this. Normally, wouldn't it be that the Citizen Advisory Council would get the report first, would get the consultant's report, you would meet with, at the Citizen's Advisory Council, you would have a chance uh, to talk, ask questions, talk among yourselves. Uh, it's my understanding the board does not attend the Citizens Advisory Council, and pretty much for the reason that uh, if a board member is there, there seems to be like there would be, maybe the board is trying to influence the Citizen Advisory Committee's decisions, or inhibit them, or make a judgment, or in some way influence. And that, and that your ability to actually meet with the consultant among yourselves, talk, ask questions, talk among yourselves, gossip about the board, whatever you want to do, but that's something that you would not be able to do in this. And then the normal procedure would be that they, you would then, Karen, you would bring a report to the board, and then we would have the consultant come as well, but you guys would have had a chance to do that whole process which you're supposed to do? So, Director Unger, if I may? Yes. Uh, to answer that question, um, this is an introductory meeting for uh, introductory stuff. And it's most effective for our time to have Alex do a presentation to both the board and the CAC. Then we're going to have a series of additional meetings that Alan can either attend or attend by phone. Um, so, it's we're not getting into the specifics. We're more talking the overarching uh, intent of the rate study and where things are going to be going. Um, so the CAC will have ample opportunity to meet without the board present. Um, and that's the similar process that we followed the last time that we had a rate study. Just a little background. So this is, this is not, it was not written up as an introductory meeting or or this and that, it just says a special meeting, a joint meeting. And I just wanted to be sure that this was not something that would inhibit the action of the Citizens Advisory Council, who are doing an incredible job and have been working on this amongst themselves. I mean, we have members on the board who have been in the Citizens Advisory right. Council. I don't think the Citizens Advisory Committee members that are here are going to be inhibited. They what? <laughs> I don't think they're going to be inhibited. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, that, that, that's, that's my understanding is why the board doesn't attend so that we don't seem to in, exert some kind of undue influence. And I just want to be sure that the Citizens Advisory Council doesn't feel that that is happening to them tonight. And I would hope they would be uh, impolite enough to say that however they felt. <laughs> well, I, I think that actually the board has always been able to attend any uh, CAC meeting that they wish to, uh, we just mostly don't because they really do get into things in detail that uh, it's easier to have the report later. And I guess that's why I feel that they're, we're horning in on their meeting, this would be their normal meeting night, and that we're, we're introducing board business and, and their 
their meeting. I just, I'm, I'm just not comfortable with it. I need to have my, my discomfort allayed. Gil, can you offer? Well, I have no legal concerns. No, it's no, 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 no right or wrong. Karen, did you want to? I mean, I don't feel inhibited. I think it's, it makes efficiency sense for us to mm -hmm. be here jointly for for this presentation. If it is information foundation based on <coughs> information, and we certainly, I don't think, anticipate any decision making for mm -hmm. ourselves here tonight. But just mm -hmm. general information, and should we need the, the uh, consultants? I'll have my voice recorded up here. Um, if I can speak on behalf of the CAC members, I am the sitting chair, and I would encourage board members to come to any CAC meeting. I know you've heard otherwise. That's not the case. I've been doing this a long time. You're welcome to come to our meeting, sit behind this board wall and don't say anything. You're welcome at our meetings. Um, I don't think I've ever heard anything negative said about or directed behind the backs of any of the board members. We do talk about funny little citizens ratepayers issues that are informative and turn up in our reports, um, but you can come and listen to that. As to the work that we're about tonight, it was presented to the board members I mean to the CAC members as an introductory information to be received only kind of meeting. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that all of my members are aware of that, that we're going to be introduced to material that will then serve us as we move forward. And I was saying to Mickey tonight that what I was expecting was something that resembled the work that we've done on rate studies before where uh, those of us in the uh, committee are sitting on the floor at tables with name plates and we have all of Alex's attention, and there is no board present. Mm -hmm. uh, that we may see that happen, and then you'll have your uh, you'll, your chance of the same information uh, without the CAC present. Uh, that may be the way it happens in the future, and I would be perfectly happy with that, as I am perfectly happy with tonight. And I so hope we'd I, actually be I, having the consultant do this three times tonight: one for you and one for us. Mm -hmm. No, no, for a meeting. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to series of meetings. Separate the meetings and the decisions made as to how appropriate they are for who's listening. Okay. That makes sense to everybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it actually makes sense that everybody gets the same message in the introductory meeting and so everybody's heard exactly the same thing and then we can go from there. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, 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 was, I was concerned, Karen and fellow mm -hmm. Citizen Advisory uh, Committee folks, just wanted to make sure that you didn't feel we were stepping on you in some way. Okay. Back okay. to where are we? We're on the still she, on the agenda. Did she vote? I I did so I could talk okay. about it. You voted. But I'll can I change my vote? We would take another vote. Uh, no. No. Oh, that's fine then. Okay. So you're you're. I'm you're, I'm you're, still a nay then I guess. You're no on the agenda. Okay. We'll move to item number five, public comment. This is the time set aside for public comment on any district-related matter not appearing on the agenda. Government code prohibits the board from taking action on these items, but they may re be referred for future consideration. Please state your name and limit your comments to three minutes. Do we have any public comment? Seeing none, we will move on to the consent calendar. Matters on the consent calendar are considered routine in nature and will be, will be enacted by a single motion without discussion. Any board member or member of the public may request an item be removed from the consent calendar and acted on separately. And the consent item, calendar items are the uh, draft minutes from the August 16th meeting, the 16-17 bad debt write up, which was reviewed by the Finance Committee on April 28th. The fourth quarter financial report, also reviewed by the Finance Committee on uh, August 28th. And the June check <coughs> registered, which they did a lot of work on August 28th. <laughs> so do I have a motion? I have a quick question for staff. Yes, sir. Um, it stated that uh, Joshua Basin Water District is billing approximately 1,000 additional counts, and I just wondered if you could elaborate on that, where the 1,000 came from. Is that from primarily from the lock meter fee? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Thank you. And I'd like to pull item number, um, 
I guess it'd be item number two, the bad debt write-offs mm -hmm. for discussion. Okay, we're back to the motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the consent calendar with the 1617 bad debt write-off pulled for discussion. I second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 So, I already done. I have a question. Yes, sir. You want to do the bad debt thing at this meeting, or we can certainly move it? Wait a minute. We need it approved. We need it approved. Okay. We need to do it this this session. Mm -hmm. I just think I think that it's interesting. And Susan, do you think you have time to do just a quick kind of read the read the report? To I can certainly read the report. Do you want me to? I need a, I need a, a microphone. microphone. Yeah. Is there a specific yeah. okay. uh, I just think it's interesting. And uh, if this was a normal week meeting, I'm sure we would be talking about it quite a bit. So the recommendation is that you approve the bad debt write-off uh, in the amount of fifteen thousand five hundred dollars and ninety-eight cents and that we defer discussion on matters related to reducing future bad debt to a subsequent meeting, so things like increasing the guarantee deposit, that sort of thing. So uh, in you know bullet format, really, uh, both the number of accounts and the amount of bad debt is increased from last year. Uh, the proposed write-off of $15,501 is an increase of 21% over last year. Uh, it's a write-off of 195 accounts, which is an increase in the quantity of accounts of 85% compared to last year, 82%, I'm sorry. Uh, that proposed write-off includes 30 of those locked meter accounts, the, the additional 1,000 customers that we're billing now. Proposed write-off is an average write-off of $79. 36% uh, of the write-off is from owners this year. That has uh, an increase uh, uh, from 22% last year, and we have a historical average there of 20%. So we're now sort of moving in a different direction. 64% uh, of the write-off is from tenants. So that's decreased from 78% <coughs> excuse me, last year and a historical average of 80%. So we used to be sort of 80-20 tenants and owners, and now we're more like 60-40. We're getting more like 60-40. Write-off amounts range from 30 cents all the way up to $652. 103 accounts had no deposit on account when their accounts were closed. So most of those were what we call our green or good credit customers. So when they came in to establish service, they had good credit at the time, didn't have to pay any deposit. Uh, or they were these locked meter accounts. Remember, those are set up automatically. People don't come in and apply for service because they have a meter, they get a bill. So we're billing, uh, and again, to Director Hun's uh, comment, we're billing a, a approximately 1,000 uh, additional accounts this year, and water revenues increased 14% compared to last year. So with more accounts being billed and more revenue, we will expect our, our bad debt to, write, to increase, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, concerning to me is this is the first time in the last five years that both the number of accounts being written off and the dollar amount is increasing. We've worked really hard over many years to push this number in the opposite direction and we did so more and more and more every single year. So, uh, this is 30 of those locked meter accounts. Uh, we build them only a portion of the fiscal year that we're writing off now. Um, unfortunately, I'll, I have the number for next year because we write it off as of 1617. What the bad debt at 63017 will be written off a year from now. So it's things where there has not been a payment in more than a year is what's written off. The number next year, twice as big as this. So the lock meter account number's going up, but that's not all that's happening here. So uh, we're seeing a lot more bad debt in all accounts, okay? Mm -hmm. Even customers who started with good credit. So. <coughs> This discussion, this follow-up discussion will be very important for us to look at what we can do going forward to reduce this bad debt in the future. So we really need to address this tonight because this relates to our audit, and our audit field work will be finished this week. So this has really got to be taken care of. So you're just really looking for us to, we can bring this approve back the and amount. talk about it later. We yeah, want to prove the amount. The amount. Right. For the audit. Right. Okay. Because the other things are policy issues. Yeah. I mean, we'll have to change our rules and regulations, our policies for how we do these, you know, the amount of the deposit or the requirements for who gets to open up accounts or things like that. And we've had those discussions. And, and I, I have them every single year. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Well, thank you so much. I thought that that was uh, interesting, and uh, yeah, for the sake of time and to get this done to your audit, you know, I guess I would recommend that we approve the 1617 bad debt write off in the amount of $15,000, 15 dollars, 15, $15,500.98. We have a second? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous for this approval. <coughs> okay, we will go on to item number seven, which is what we're all here for, which is the great study. And, uh, no. no. What? Number seven. Number seven. Yeah. Yeah. The rate yeah. study. Number seven. It is the rate study. Right. Item the number seven. Yeah. 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 The agenda was updated, okay. right? So some folks yeah. might have the old agenda because it was updated. Oh, I, th I think that you, yeah. 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 So we'll go with the agenda that the board has. That's what we that's what we posted, is it not? Okay, so yeah. And my agenda has item number seven is the rate study. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, Karen. And uh, I will uh, like to introduce Alex Handler, who has done the rate study for many years for us, who is <coughs> extremely knowledgeable about Joshua Basin Water District, and please welcome him. Thank nice you. to have you here again. Thank you, Alex. Yay. <laughs> well, nice to see everybody again. I've, some folks I've you know, we've seen over the years, the last eight, ten years or so, I think, since I've been uh, working with the district, and some new folks too, I know. Um, but tonight, uh, it was presentation kind of kicking off the rate study. And what we've got is some background information. I think we did something similar to this the last time kind of covering a little bit of the background, what the rates look like, making sure we're all on the same page, uh, talking a little bit about district finances and what are some of the financial challenges you're facing. And there's no action being taken tonight. It's just more, hey, we're kicking off a study. Here are some things. And also, if there's any preliminary issues, questions, things you want addressed, anything related to water rates or you know finances here, you know, please, everyone, maybe at the, after this initial presentation, it's not too long, maybe we can open it up for just open discussion and whatever process we'll defer to the district to go through. Um, yeah, any concerns, things like that, that folks have been hearing in the community, it's always appreciated. But maybe with that, let me, um, I guess I can turn this on, get cranking through this. Um, so water rate study introduction, I kind of covered what we're going to talk about. Uh, first thing I just wanted to cover, um, since I don't think we've worked with everyone who's here, is who we are. I'm with a firm, by Alex Handlers, with Bartle Wells Associates. We are an independent financial consulting firm. We specialize in water, wastewater, rates, and finance. We do a lot of financial planning, water rate studies, connection fee studies. We also do financing. It's probably about a third of our work. If an agency needs help getting, you know, a bond market or bank loan, or we're big proponents of state revolving fund loans and other subsidized funding programs. Uh, we've been around the state for over 50 years. We've worked for more than 500 agencies, and we're the ones who did the last. I'm the one who worked on the last two rate studies. I guess going. I guess it is 10 years, yeah. going back mm -hmm. to 2007. And coming out of that, I think the district's been you know, gradually moving the rates in the right direction, which is a good thing, you know, taking gradual steps. But there, as you'll find out, there are some pretty significant challenges that need to be addressed in one form or other. Um, in terms of our study, there's a few components to it. One I call the 10-year financial plan. That's really the big picture. What are our funding needs going out into the future for operating, maintenance, capital needs, um, you've got a lot of aging infrastructure, imported water, things like that, and getting a good sense of, you know, what are the revenue requirements? And there are different ways of achieving those revenue requirements. There's no single one right answer. I'm not, I don't just go back and tell you here's what it has to be. We do want as much input as possible because there are different ways of getting from point A to point B. Um, the next thing is the cost of service rate analysis. 
under in California, water wastewater rates are subject to Proposition 218, which has different requirements for water wastewater rates. We have to make sure that the rates are complying with all the legal requirements. But again, there are different alternatives there with the rate structure. Um, there's different types of rates out there. Yours are inclining tiers. Some agencies still have uniform rates. A few agencies have something called water budgets. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more a little later. Uh, the next thing is you've got some water and wastewater capacity charges that have been on the books for five years or so. These are the one-time charges that are paid by new connections to the system with the goal being that the new development is funding its fair share of costs and paying its own way for infrastructure. So those are going to be reviewed. The good news is in the interim, since the last update, the district has those escalating each year by construction cost inflation to keep everything in line. So we don't foresee being big changes in those, but just want to make sure they're fair. And the final thing is, as I mentioned, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go off and get, say here's what the answer has to be. There's a lot of correct answers, and that's what we are really appreciative of the process here, getting everyone's input from the CAC, the board, the public, um, to hopefully build consensus for where do we go from here. As far as this district, I, you know, it's always nice to keep in mind this is a community-governed public agency. It's not a state mandate what you have to do. This is local folks on the board and the CAC trying to figure out what's best for this community, understanding there's a balance of competing objectives for, for what you want to do. Um, you've got about a 100-mile service area. You've got over 300 miles of pipelines. A lot of them are old in need of repair replacement in upcoming years, you, you, you know, wells, water tanks. Um, they're not cheap to replace and repair these things. A lot of these facilities were put in pipelines many years ago, and when they're put in new, everything works just great. You don't really need to make much investment in them. But as things start to age, they start requiring more maintenance, replacement. And this is all throughout the state of California. There's just a lot of infrastructure that's you know, 50, 60, 100 years old. And it's you know kind of like a tidal wave of pipeline replacements and facility upgrades are are in the works for many agencies, but these can be addressed over time. It's not like you're going to address them all in the next few years. Um, groundwater has been a big issue here. Groundwater has historically been the only source of supply. Uh, unfortunately, the groundwater gets minimum dis minimal dis uh, what do I put there minimal natural recharge. Um, and there's been more and more demand on it you know, over the years. The demand's higher than the recharge, so the groundwater table's been going up, down. The district's been you know, obviously proactively trying to address that with the, the pipeline and the, the imported water from a hobby water agency. But right now, you just started importing that water and uh, putting it back in the groundwater basin. But there may need to be you know, more imported water in the future to, to keep the basin in balance. Um, so that's a big, that's your kind of long-term water supply solution is, you know, how much water do you need to bring in, how quickly do you need to get there. In terms of finances, like many districts in California, you're self-supporting. You do get a little bit of money from property tax revenues, but a big chunk of it is from rates. As such, the rates have got to be adequate to fund the cost of service, and it's really the rates are kind of the underpinnings of the financial stewardship that in turn underlies the operational and facility stewardship for this district. Um, the last study was completed about five years ago. We did seven years of, uh, five years of 7% rate increases. But I kind of put a longer term trend here. Originally, going back to 2007, the original rate increase was for four 6% rate increases. As those were rolling out, the district said, hey, maybe we can, you know, don't have to fully implement them as quickly as possible. So the second row down shows what was actually implemented. You spread those four sixes really over five years. Um, then there was a couple years of no rate increases. Been back to the drawing boards again, and the district opted to move ahead through this whole process with 7% rate increases each year. You add it up over, you know, the 10, 11 years of you know, some sixes, some threes, some zeros, some sevens, um, and it works out to be an average annual increase of about four and a half percent. 
keep in mind a chunk of that is inflation. So, you know, inflation plus. It is haven't been, from my perspective, working with other agencies, they haven't been huge rate increases, but maybe from the ratepayer perspective, any rate increase is <laughs> never desired. Um, comparing to other agencies out there, you guys are kind of in the lower middle range. I'll show that in a second. What we've seen with water use is, you know, during the a long time ago, water use was higher. Um, there's been a general downward trend in water use, and agencies all around California, leading into the drought, it kind of took another nosedive a little bit more. Your water use was already pretty low, so it wasn't like your water use came down 20, 30, 40 percent. You came down, it looked like about 17 percent over a year when the drought, when the major drought hit. Then since then, last year, there's a little bit of a bounce back, so you're about 10 percent lower than where you were a few years ago. Um, typical bill is about nine units per month, 900 cubic feet. 100 cubic feet is about 750 gallons. It's about 220 gallons per day. Uh, so the average bill is a little less than $55 per month. Obviously, some folks might have uh, higher water demands, pay more, and certainly a lot of folks pay less. Two thirds of the bill or of the bills in this district are below that $55 level. And they may change seasonally. Some people use a little in the winter and use more in the summer. This I wanted to cover again. I, I assume folks are pretty familiar with the water rate structure, but just to make sure uh, everyone understands it, there are two components to your rates. There's a fixed service charge that's paid every month regardless of water consumption, and it varies by meter size. Larger meters pay more they put more demand on the system. And this charge helps recover some of the fixed charges of the district. Now, for a district that produces its own water supply, a big, a very high percentage of your costs are fixed costs. It doesn't mean you want your rates to be, you know, 90% fixed rates and, you know, 10 cents per unit of water. Um, so there's kind of a balance. Hey, what do we think is a fair way of recouping these costs? And in the last study, kind of the numbers we were targeting was you know, roughly 40% of reven rate revenues recovered from the fixed charges, 60% from the volumetric side. On the volumetric side, uh, the three-quarter and one-inch customers, which is most of the single-family residential and there's some small commercial, pay according to four inclining water rate tiers. So everyone get those folks get the first five units at the lowest tier, the next five units at the at the next tier up, and so on and so forth. Um, folks with larger meters, if they were paying according to these same tiers, and it was a school, for example, well, within about one day, they'd be into tier three and end up paying a higher overall rate of water. So what most agencies have is, you know, tiered rates for the residential folks or sometimes a small commercial and a uniform rate for the larger meters who pay higher fixed charges and tend to use more. But the, the weighted average rate is on par between the two. So the residences might start lower and end up paying a little bit higher, but it's the same weighted average that the commercial is paying right out of the gate. So commercial pays more for the first unit, less for the last unit, but it's on balance equal. Your rates are, as I mentioned, 100 cubic feet, roughly 750 gallons. So what are your rates equal? Right now the rates go from $3 to 350 to 4 to 450. So they're inclining. They're not too steep. We work with some agencies. The rates might go from $4 to $8 to $12 to $16. Very steep inclining with tiers. So yours are kind of moderate. Um, during the last rate study, historically, I think there were three tiers. And coming out of the Citizen Advisory Committee process, it was decided, hey, let's make a fourth tier so it's a little more graduated and step up. Um, and last time also, the the difference in the rates between the tiers was stepped up a little bit. So I think originally when we started working here, the rates went from you know, $3 to $3.10, mm -hmm. $3.20. So almost a uniform rate. And there's nothing wrong with the uniform rate. But you know, over time, it was steepened a little bit to where it is today, where it's you know, $0.50 cents different per tier um, and scheduled to go a little bit higher next year. Um, but in terms of 100 gallons, as probably people can understand it a little better, your rates range from the first tier is about 40 cents per 100 gallons. Then it goes up by, you know, seven, six cents per 100 gallons to the top tier is about 60 cents per 100 gallons. 
Now we'll just leave it at that. There are different types of rate structures, so that's something if people are uncomfortable or some issues they want changed or even looked at with a rate structure, I mean, that's part of this process, so we're here to, to help with that. Here's the rate survey, um, a number of, you know, surrounding communities in the general region where your monthly bill stands compared to others at the level of nine units per month, which is a typical residential user here in the district. So you're kind of in that middle range, at the lower end of that middle range. Um, certainly there's some agencies that have a lot lower rates. Doesn't mean they're any more efficient than you are. They might um, not have to import any water. Maybe they're not making investments in their capital infrastructure. Maybe they've got some very large commercial industrial customers sometimes. Um, and all the way up at the right, you've got some of these smaller county service areas where the, the monthly bill can be you know, over $100 for water alone doesn't mean they're being inefficient either. That's just, you've got, your rates have got to cover your cost of service. Uh, here's a chart of the water use from the past six years. And I broke it up among the different tiers that you have. So the, the four blue to light blue ones are the, the tiered use for the smaller meter sizes. And at the top is the kind of, I guess, a greenish blue, aqua, whatever. Um, that's you, the water use by the larger meters. So you can see, you know, water use went down about 17% with a little rebound. The other thing you might observe is the tier one water use doesn't really change <coughs> that much yeah. when water use comes down because if someone's using 10 units of water and they go down to nine, they're still going through tier one using five units in tier one. But you can see some of the, um, the upper tiers, the, the lightest blue and the one below it, those are the ones that came down the most during the drought and also rebounded a little bit more now that the drought is over. Uh, but not a huge fluctuation, again, because the starting point, you don't have a lot of folks with watering large yards where there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for, for water conservation. This chart shows the long-term traje trajectory of what a typical bill is. The chart may be a little unfair because for the, the uh, 10 years prior to 2014, I assume the average use was 10 units, but we know in the past it was probably higher, more like 12. But, so this assumes people use 10 units, but in the last couple of years have cut down to nine units, which seems to be the new norm. And this is common with a lot, of Asian, a lot of other agencies. You know, people used to use more. They've cut back, and it might not be as the lowest it was during the drought when people cut back more, but it seems to be a new norm where it's kind of leveled off but it remains to be seen what happens in the future. Um, but you can see the blue line shows what the typical bill has been for the typical residential customer, I'll call it. And it's gradually increased over time. You see there's a little a bump up one year. There was a, rate, a larger rate increase. And then I know a new board came in and they rolled back rates. <laughs> and that's about when we got hired, they rolled back rates. And I think the finances were heading south and we did a rate study, and I remember some of the board members up here were, you know, they were voted for the rate D, they voted to roll back the rates. That's how they got into office. But now that they understood the finances, they recognized that the rates had to be raised because you have to fund your cost of service, and they didn't want to fully neglect the infrastructure, things along that line. So that was kind of the first chunk of rate increases. Um, but one thing I'll notice, point out is long term, you know, I talked about 4.5% rate increases over the last decade. People have also cut back their water use. If they've cut back from 10 to 9, there's a 10% you know, cut back in the amount of water they're buying. So they're, it's not necessarily that the typical bill went up with the rates. And you look long term, the typical bill going back from 1996, I guess there was a rate roll back after that, it's only gone up about 1.7% per year over 20 years. So folks now are, and that's, this is not even, if I was to put some kind of inflation factor in here and adjust everything down where it's discounted by inflation, folks today aren't paying that much different than they did probably 20 years ago in real dollar terms. Yet you're facing a lot of new challenges that weren't being faced back then. The red dotted line shows, well, what if rates had just been escalated at 3% per year? Some rough estimate of inflation, they'd be 
a lot higher than they are now. Financially, I mean, my take is that this district has done a good job. I think you've got a good process with the Citizen Advisory Committee and with the board, and people have uh, supported gradually increasing rates um, over the last 10 years. So you've kept your rates moving in the right direction. Are you getting enough revenues now to meet everything you'd like to do? Far from it, but at least you're moving in the right direction to address some of the highest priority needs out there. Uh, you have a healthy level of fund reserves right now. Part of that's because some of those funds are uh, planned to be used for some significant capital needs in upcoming couple of years or so. Um, so my take is that with the gradual rate increases that you've done, you're in decent financial health right now, but you are facing challenges that are, I think, more significant than what we uh, looked at last time we were here with capital, groundwater recharge, potential need for chromium-6 and, and just inflation. I just wanted to cover those in a little more detail. Um, one is the long-term water supply situation. Again, it's been groundwater forever. It's like a lot of straws put in the sand and the water table's been going down and down and down. So um, you've, been, you've started the water imports now. Your recharge facility just went in just three, three, three years ago. So the, there is some water being brought in to recharge the basin. Not as much as coming out of the basin, um, but to generate more water, to put in the basin, to bring things in balance, would require buying more water from Mojave Water Agency. So it's an increase <coughs> in cost uh, that will factor in. And we can look at you know, different levels of water imports. You know, again, it's like kind of a balance and what the impacts are um, but long term, that may be, you may need to rely on imported water for recharge for almost 100% of the water supply over the long run. On the capital side, I've already mentioned, you've got a lot of old facilities. It's you know over um, 175 miles or so. Pipelines are you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 plus years old. It doesn't have to be a big tidal well wave crashing at once but there does need to be funding for capital needs. You've also got uh, old tanks, uh, wells, other things that are in constant need of repair, upgrade, replacement. And the district's engineer, Dudak, did a, an analysis of kind of what are the capital needs, and they try to spread it out over a long horizon, understanding it's not an emergency. You don't have to rip up the water pipes and replace them tomorrow, but you should prudently plan to address some of this stuff. Um, and they came up with about two and a half million per year. It fluctuates a little from year to year depending on what the projects are, but that's kind of a ballpark estimate of what they thought would be a prudent level of ongoing funding needs, not just for 20 years, but it's probably going out, you know, 50 years or something. I think they originally were looking a little longer term. Um, so there will be likely need to be some level of rate increases. For capital, and if you think two and a half million dollars, you're already funding some level of capital, but the total rate revenues now are uh, five to six million. Mm -hmm. So two and a half million to generate that much more money is a pretty substantial rate increase. Again, you don't have to get there overnight, um, but and we that's I guess we'll talk about some of the, uh, the some of the initial financial options I think that the, that was presented to the board before that we could use as kind of a starting place to see what rates look like under a few scenarios. The next thing was chromium-6 treatment. Um, local groundwater in a lot of areas of the state has got chromium-6. The old standard in uh, California was 50 parts per million, which was half of what the, the federal standard was 100 parts per billion. I'm sorry. And chromium-6 this is the Aaron Brockovich chemical that folks uh, know about. So, um, you know, a lot of agencies need to address that. A few years back, California came up with a new standard of 10 parts per billion, which was a big difference from the 50 parts per billion. And all of a sudden, your water, which meets the 50 parts per billion standard, is out of compliance, as well as a number of other agencies. So, uh, you know, it looked like you had a mandate that you had to address this and get in compliance by January 2020. <coughs> so some agencies have already kind of done everything they need to do. Um, 
the costs are pretty substantial. Everyone always thinks of the capital costs. The engineering estimates are about $16 million for the capital facilities and equipment needed to address the Chrome 6 issue. Good news is the district's been working with State, uh, state Water Resources Control Board and the State Revolving Fund and already has a 0% loan for five years, a 1.6 million loan they were able to get to for the initial planning level and there's potential to get some significant grant funding. It's never guaranteed, um, but I know there's hope that there will be grant funding and the state has kind of implied that that is a reasonable possibility. And the other thing is if there does need to be financing, it sounds like the state is supportive that you would have a, a reasonably good shot of getting a state revolving fund loan, which are highly sought after. These are loans that now go out to 30 years. Current rate is 1.8%. So it's roughly inflation. Yeah, you have to pay interest, but the interest rate's the same as inflation. It's almost free money. It's uh, much preferable than if you have to go out and borrow money in the, the regular municipal bond market. But that's actually, those rates are pretty pretty low right now too, but they're certainly not 1.8%. Um, things have changed recently though. In May, there are you know, some legal suits about the Chrome 6 regulations. Uh, there was a ruling in May that, that put the regulations on hold because the state didn't do enough to consider all the economic considerations because it is expensive and it's really hit a lot of communities and a lot of communities that can't afford it had to shell out a lot of money or we're looking at shelling out you know 20 million dollars plus operating costs you know everyone always thinks of the capital costs as being the big component but if you had to finance 16 million dollars and you're able to get six million in grants that leaves 10 million to be financed if you get a state revolving fund loan the annual debt service would be about 500,000 per year or less for borrowing 10 million dollars so that's really 500,000 per year in rates so that sounds a little more manageable than 16 million. But on the operating side, uh, the initial estimates are in the million dollar range per year for the operating costs alone. Now there's different technologies being evaluated out there, maybe that could come down. But so the operating could be twice as much as the capital in terms of the rate impact. But that's where I was going. The, the regulations have been put on hold temporarily. The state's gonna have to go through a new process of considering the economic feasibility no one knows for sure where that's going to come out. Some people think that, hey, they're just going to go through the process and come right back to that 10 parts per billion standard. If that's the case, you're going to have to do what's currently being proposed. It's just going to be bumped out to, who knows, five years down the line or so. So maybe it's not something that impacts you right away, but something to keep on the planning horizon when you're looking at your financial projections. We'll put those in the 10-year projections. And again, it's easy for us to look at, you know, what if there was no Chrome 6? What if there was? What are the, what are the different impacts? So that's another big one that's looming on the horizon. And the other one everyone, uh, I shouldn't say everyone forgets about, but even if you had nothing to do and everything was perfect and your rates were right in line with your cost of service, you still would need small gradual rate increases each year to keep up with cost inflation, whether it's electricity, insurance, staffing, cost of facilities goes up every year. Uh, and CalPERS is another one. Now you're luckily, because you don't have a big liability here like a lot of other agencies. Um, however, CalPERS is cha changing the way they're calculating what your annual contributions are. These are you know, these actuarial tables that look out you know, 20, 30 years into the future. And they used to assume that you get this, high, what's considered now, very high level rate of return, rate of return yeah. <laughs> on all this money you're setting aside yeah. so you'll have enough to pay the benefits 20 30 years down the line well they're realizing well the returns aren't yeah. quite what they uh, were hoping they were in the past so they're in the process of ratcheting back their discount rate so as it goes down that's less interest earnings it means it's more money you have to put in up front so there's things like that that would get factored in as well you're lucky this is not going to be a huge impact like it is for some other agencies that I work for. But if you think about it, I mean, rates going up 3% per year, that's just treading water. So, you know, going 5% a year, that's really only getting you a tiny bit each year. Sorry to be the bearer of all this bad news, but <laughs> that's some of the things that will be considered as we go through the rate study. And again, there's, there's no 
right way of getting from here to there. There's a lot of ways and a lot of competing objectives that uh, folks may want to weigh in on. And every, people may have different ideas. I know we've worked with the, community, the Citizen Advisory Committee in the past, and some people thought it should be this way, some people thought it should be that way. But at the end of the day, we hope we can come with some consensus that can be then a recommendation brought to the board. The last thing I wanted to just touch on was Prop 218. That is the uh, kind of the legal structure that your rates operate under. It was a, a voted constitutional amendment in 1996. It put Articles 13 C and D in the California Constitution, and it's Article 13 D, one of those sections, applies to property-related charges, which is what your water rates are here. Over the years, there have been a number of evolving legal interpretations of what does it mean to comply with this, or if you're not going to comply. Um, so we're going to make sure that the rate study meets all the latest legal interpretations. Your district attorney is well versed in all the latest and greatest with Prop 218 ruling. So last time there was legal review as part of the process. That's going to happen again to make sure your rates are fully compliant. And it also means that you can't do whatever you want with your rates. You can't just say, hey, we're going to, um, some agencies, for example, we're going to have a, a top tier that's $100 a unit. There has to be some, you know, tie-in with cost of service for stuff, some reasonable nexus, understanding there's a, a little flexibility for what's reasonable. <coughs> but Prop 218 put two kind of requirements on the rates. One of the substantive requirements, so everyone knows the money that comes to the district, the rates cannot exceed the cost of service. There were some cities that had been using water rates to subsidize police, mm -hmm. libraries, things like that. So you, you don't have that here, you're, uh, you know, a, a water district. But um, so that was ruled. You can't do that. Um, the rates can only be used for the purposes for which they're collected, and there has to be a proportionate cost recovery, a reasonably fair recovery. You can't say a oh, residential rates two dollars a unit, commercial rates ten dollars a unit. There's got to be a, you know reasonableness and fairness in your rates. And the other side of the coin, there's the procedural requirements that you went through last time and the time before that. Uh, in order to raise rates, you have to mail notice to all property owners and or customers, informing them of what the rate increases are, informing them you're going to be holding a public hearing. You have to mail that notice at least 45 days before you have the public hearing. And at the public hearing, the rates are subject to something called majority protest, meaning if more than 50% of the folks submit written protests, you can't move forward with the, the rate increase. Now, the odds of that happening are extremely low. But it does happen on rare occasion. It's happened with a couple of other agencies I've worked for where there's some you know, organized opposition, or maybe it's a very small district that only has a few hundred customers and someone goes door to door and they can say whatever they want, and, you know, sign here. Um, but the other thing is, this is the thing that comes up in a lot of public meetings. There's no voting requirement for rates. The, the Constitutional Amendment Prop 218 was called the Right to Vote on Taxes Initiative. Why is there no vote for water and wastewater rates? Because the, the people, yeah, not a tax, mm -hmm. and the people who wrote it recognize that these are cost of service issues. And it, it's always, who would ever vote for a rate increase? You know what I mean? It's a kind of a political <laughs> decision yeah. to vote no. So they, it kind of turned it from being a strictly political decision to recognizing this is more of a cost of service decision. That's why we don't have a vote. Um, so that's why water, and now potentially stormwater charges as well. Mm -hmm. If this bill, if there's another bill that was just out there to have stormwater charges exempt from mm -hmm. the voting requirements. But your rates, even without having a vote, there's still the majority protest and there's still the substantive requirements. So the rates can't, you know, exceed the reasonable cost of service. Doesn't mean you can't keep fund reserves, doesn't mean you can't save up money for future capital needs, but you can't have a rate that's you know collecting 100 when really you only need 50 and you're just siphoning the money away. So that's not happening here, I can guarantee you. Um, but that kind of concludes. That's kind of the background. So that's where we're at now. You've been doing these gradual rate increases. Last time, we kind of modified the rate structure based on input from the Citizen Advisory Committee. Going forward, there's a lot of financial challenges. And I think that's going to be some of the the big issues to get input on is once you see the numbers, 
and we could have separate meetings as we did last time, sitting around a table, kind of hashing through stuff, mm -hmm. people raising questions, bringing up ideas. Um, you know, how do we want to get from here to there or, or take steps in the right direction? And is there anything we want to change in the rate structure? When I look at it from now, I think a lot of the, the issues of the rate structure in the past were addressed, but maybe you do want to keep the rates uh, adding a little more conservation center or steepening the tiers a little bit. Maybe you don't. Maybe you want more or less fixed cost recovery in the future. Maybe you want to keep it roughly where it is. Um, the notion of water budgets has been brought up in some agencies. We were talking about it earlier. Uh, it's a different type of rate structure where it's essentially inclining tier rates like you have, but the tier breakpoints are uh, individually established for every customer. So if you're a customer with smaller household, you get less water. If you're a customer with a large yard, some of the other agencies out there that have done budgets, they give people more water for a large yard, which in my mind, the analogy is like someone drives the Prius, then they only get five gallons, but if they drive the Cadillac Escalade, then they get 25 gallons <laughs> at the lower rate. So there's pluses and minuses for these things. Water budgets also have a lot of administrative challenges that also cost money to administer and maintain. And then there's always the case of, you know, hey, my uh, friends were visiting from out of town this month. My kid's back for the summer. <laughs> Who knows what? You know, we have, uh, I have a medical need, so I should get more water. It kind of creates a lot of administrative stuff. We can go down whatever path and discuss things. I mean, I've got my own opinions, um, but happy to, you know, try to present the pros and cons of, of different ideas and different alternatives that could be out there. Maybe I'll leave it at that, and I, I think there's some additional stuff that you guys wanted to cover. Yes, sir. Do, you have, do you have any questions for Alex first? Any, any questions from the board? Just a, sorry. You're the senior guy. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we'll go down the road. yeah, go down the road. You can go first. I was just kind of curious about um, uh, you mentioned uh, um, how we have uh, reserves for capital improvements. They're more or less they're assigned to uh, to specific things. There's categories for it, and I was kind of wondering. I assume you're going to factor in to uh, our rate structure what our reserves are, but do you yourself, your group, um, prioritize um, or change in any way based on what our reserves are? In other words, do you decide in your rate structure if our reserves are spendable uh, or not? Yeah, I think that's something we would work with staff and get input from the committee and the board on. Um, but yeah, I mean, the reserves, I think that's part of the process is trying to, you know, identify what are reasonable targets to aim to maintain? Maybe some reserves you need to keep a little higher. Other reserves, maybe you can draw down and maybe you have, you know, it could be possible you have more reserves than are targeted right now. So that would be factor in the study that some of those reserves can be used in the front end to help fund capital needs maybe as you're, as you're phasing in rate increases, for example. But yeah, all that would, would be factored in from the uh, answering your question. Dr. Just a comment. I just wanted to say that I was very impressed with your presentation. Uh, succinct, clear, comprehensive. It was really fabulous. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, knows us well. <coughs> Director Anger. Yeah, I guess he does know us well. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like things we've been discussing here. <laughs> Almost yep. every board meeting, you know, these are things that we've been, been talking about. And I guess maybe this is a question for Alex, but maybe for... Uh, <coughs> admin on uh, the page where it says rates and finances and it shows from 2007 to 2018 adopted rates and implemented the last rate study completed in 2013 which I guess uh, there were adopted rates of 7% increase per year but have we? Yes. So oh, yeah. We've been increasing rates every January. 7%. I mean it, that's across the board. So you know cumulative Seven percent. And this is actually an issue that I think we're going to be looking for input on. There's another seven, the last seven percent increase is scheduled to go into effect yeah. this upcoming January. Yeah. We're kind of working on a rate study now and on, from the scheduling perspective, probably the soonest we could work through the process, 
do that Prop 218 with its you know 45 day minimum waiting period, hold the public hearing, get the rates in place. Probably wouldn't be till um, very likely March 1st. So you know, do you do one rate increase in January and then do a little additional step up in March? Do you def defer the one in January and wait till March? So, and we'll have to see what the numbers look like, but that's one of the many issues to get, you know, how do you guys want to do it? Thank you. Okay, any uh, comments from anybody in the public? <coughs> any questions? Feel free. Yes, John. I have a question. Uh, regarding the, <coughs> the new... Uh, you, you, would you just step oh, up sure. there so that uh, Bob can get you on camera, please? Thank you. I'm Johnny Painter. I live up in uh, Copper Mountain Mesa. Uh, I have, uh, actually have two questions then, uh, or it's a two-part question. Uh, one is, as we look at new rates, are we considering uh, any accommodation for ratepayers who are on really low or really fixed incomes? And and my the second part of that question is, uh, I'm really interested in how other people feel about that. Uh, I, I've been very fortunate, and I could afford to pay a bit of a premium on my rates to help subsidize other people. I know a lot of my neighbors are struggling, and and I, I, I've heard people in this room talk about struggling. So uh, I, I, I think we ought to at, uh, at least take a look at that, and I'd like to know what other people think. Thanks. Thank you. You want to just take them with you, Alex, and address them later? Oh, sure. You want me to address them now? It's up to you. Oh. Yeah, um, certainly there are some agencies out there that have low income discounts from a legal perspective. Um, you're not supposed to charge one group of rate payers more to fund the low income discount. Yeah. So it has to come from non rate revenues, but you're lucky you do have some. You do get, you know, a chunk of uh, property tax revenues, I think a few hundred thousand per year, and maybe you've got some other revenue sources. Um, so it's certainly a possibility if that's what folks want to entertain. And again, you mentioned there could, you know, the state is looking into something else, also the same issue right now. There's a statewide effort to look at kind of statewide, how could they fund some sort of a low income discount or some kind of discount along those lines. Who knows where it's going? Is it going to be that they, you know, add a surcharge on everyone's rates around the state and then people can apply and get funds? So there is a, the state is looking into that as well, but I don't know. There's, I guess they're supposed to be reporting back their initial findings in January. So there might be something at the state level, but you know, who knows if that's going to happen. I'd say about a quarter to a third of agencies probably have some sort of low income discount. And it's not something, I mean, it could, you know, I know in the past the district I think had something like that and they had to look at people's tax returns. Generally, you want to make it administratively simple. So there are some agencies that have a discount that piggybacks off something else, could be like the care program from Southern California Edison, or if someone qualifies for some other program, they bring in proof of that each year and potentially could be eligible for, for some level of uh, rate assistance. But I'm, I will defer to the, some agencies want to have these things, sometimes we have legal issues in some agencies where they don't want to go down that path, um, but it's certainly something that could be explored. I'll defer to. Yeah, the legislature. Citizen advisory committee. Yeah, the legislature yeah. is equally concerned, and they've addressed that issue. And there is a, the state water resources control board has been uh, asked to, to come back with a report in January, <coughs> like Alex has referred to, coming up with ways to fund such a program, a rate assistance program for low income people. <coughs> Locally, it's a slippery slope. There are constitutional restrictions on get the public funds. There's also Prop 218 limitations. It's a slippery slope. Uh, the most aggressive I've seen in some agencies I've represented have utilized this. That's using passive income such as lease income from uh, antennas for cell phones mm -hmm. and allocated to fund such a program. But even that is legally a slippery slope. Interesting. Okay, any other questions? I have a chairman. Uh, yes, sir. Are you opening it up to the CAC right now or to everybody? The questions. You can bring it up right now. No, it's, it's, uh, I'm just wondering if, if it's, if it's uh, correct that I assume that you're opening it up to the CAC right now? No. And then the pu general public afterwards? No, it's open to anybody right now. Al <coughs> Marquez, uh, Sunfair Community. 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, the whole community knows that we live in a, a depressed uh, community. Uh, the medium uh, per capita income is approximately $26,000 a year. And uh, in other communities, it's uh, right around $50,000. So uh, the uh, community is not against any rate increases that the district might incur. But the thing is, is that they want a, a reasonable rate increases. Uh, since uh, 2007 to 2017, of course, 10 years has passed, uh, the uh, reserve funds in the Josta Basin Water District were approximately $4 million. At this point in time, in 2017, the reserve funds are over $9 million. So with these rate increases that we've had in the last 10 years, uh, that has increased the reserve funds. Um, but the uh, bottom line is, is that uh, Again, I like to say that uh, the community is, is a depressed community and uh, they need uh, some fair uh, rate increases and not uh, maximum rate increases. Uh, the other question I have is, uh, what is the thought about the next five years? Is there gonna be uh, substantial rate increases for the next five years? That's what's planned? Thank you. And nothing has been planned. I think that's what this whole process is about, trying to look at what the funding needs are, and come up with that balance. I mean, I, from what I've seen so far, there are definitely significant funding needs out there, but you know, what's the comfort level and how are we gonna start addressing some of those needs? Um, and there's no, again, doesn't mean you have to next year all of a sudden jack up the rates a lot, but there might be, again, like another process of gradual increases, but this is what we're gonna defer to the Community advisory, the citizen advisory committee, um, to give some guidance on. I think you've got good folks who are on the citizen advisory committee just from prior times were very knowledgeable. They're in touch with the community. They're in the community themselves. Same with your board. Um, so they, I think, offer a broad range of perspectives from, from folks who live here. Uh, so I think it's a good process. A lot of agencies don't have citizen advisory committee like that. Just for the board's information, how many of you were actually on the Citizens Advisory Committee? Wow, very good. You need to get on that, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> the whole yes, out. <laughs> Not putting them on the spot Jeff, or anything. Know from the Copper Mountain Basin <laughs> area as well, way out on Winter Road, almost in the other water district, but. Um, I know we have our uh, recharge ponds and they're working very well and there's some discussion, has been some thoughts of what to do with the, that capacity. I'm wondering, and it doesn't have to be answered tonight, but one of the questions is, are there districts where they moved with their importing water to the point where they were importing so much, either because of their community growth or other reasons, that then it might come into question whether you move that water into a recharge basin or your basin or you simply move that into your water distribution system, so I'm not sure about that. Kind of funky question, but yeah. yeah. No, and both happens. I mean, some agencies, they're importing the water, and that's that's the direct water supply. Here, that's not the case. You've got the recharge basins. You've got the wells that pull it out in other areas, and there may be uh, good economic and operational reasons for that, but I, I'm not familiar with all the details on that. Yeah, because you have to treat first yeah. oh, okay. to put it into your distribution yeah. system. Yeah. Oh, okay. the water you're getting is untreated. Right. Oh, state water project right. water, untreated. Yes. Yeah. You've got very high quality water that's been treated. Okay. And also, maybe, the, I don't know if your if your whole system is really set up for that, but yours right now is you have the re recharge the basin, but the wells are kind of scattered about. Um, so I don't think there's any engineering inclination to change what what's happening there, but there are some other agencies that's, a, that's their whole water supply that piped in and maybe it goes to a treatment plant first mm -hmm. and then they, they pipe mm -hmm. it in. Yeah. yeah, we have a natural treatment plant as it goes down through the aquifer, mm -hmm. down through the... Right. Okay, any other questions? Alex, thank you very much. We appreciate you being here again mm -hmm. this year and all your hard work and look forward to the details. Likewise, yeah. <laughs> and I'll be back and I think we're going to exactly what was brought up last time, have, you know, 
maybe a roll up the sleeves meeting with the uh, citizen advisory committee we hash through the things in a little more detail and you know get input on you could see what things look like and kind of shape the way this whole process goes in terms of scheduling I just want to mention if you did want to get ready there's no law you have to have raised in place by March 1 we were just talking about that as kind of a, a realistic target that means you know looking backwards a lot of stuff has to happen between now and November December um, and I think right now the committee meets every other month but maybe there could be some interim meeting in there uh, so we get a couple meetings in before then I mean the, the schedule could we're not on the yeah, as far legally as the, mandated schedule but. as far as the schedule goes going for March 1st rate study or rate implementation we're gonna have to meet in October November and December um, so at least every other board meeting I remember in December because of aqua there's only one board meeting but we can always have a special meeting so there is a lot of work to get ready to do the uh, public hearing announcement in early January so you can have it 45 days later so I would be asking the CAC to in the next three months to meet monthly um, and it's all dependent on when Alan can uh, Alex can uh, bring uh, bring bring the next round of, of numbers and, and uh, what rates uh, look like and I do want to remind you with a short uh, presentation basically what I'm saying is Alex isn't done yet because <laughs> <laughs> um, because I want to remind the public the board this community this, you got me doing it now citizens advisory committee that about three months ago um, we have given Alex three different scenarios right and the first scenario we, we named the best management practice it may not be best management practice but that's what we called it and in the first column, the second column, there's Chromium 6 planning loan. That's a recognition that if we use the $1.6 million of loan monies, interest-free loans, we still have to pay it back in four years. Mm -hmm. So that column reflects a cost that we would need to be planning for in our rate study. Now, because of Chromium 6 MCL changes, I doubt we're going to tap into the $1.6 million 1.6 million for planning and and uh, planning of construction so those numbers may drop out um, the CIP funding is this in, in this scenario the 2.5 million that the capital improvement plan calls for to address infrastructure is 2.5 million or two two million five hundred yeah 2.5 million mm -hmm. every year right the additional reserves that's uh, uh, upgrading our reserve uh, numbers looking at what for example equipment and technology should actually be funded at each year uh, it doesn't currently include the emergency generators that probably need to be replaced in 2020 I think it would be uh, cheaper to just keep our generators and when we run them Ill illegally uh, pay the fine um, but but those are uh, reserves for buildings and shops and <coughs> dump trucks and SCADA and uh, other technology so the additional recharge under this scenario is uh, there's another 500 acre feet so we're already importing 500 it's to take us to a thousand acre feet we don't have to do that but that would take us to balance what we're basically extracting each year from the Joshua Tree subbasin and put that same amount back in so the water table should stop dropping mm -hmm. if eventually you were to go to 1958 acre feet eventually the aquifer would actually start coming back up and in this scenario, the Chrome 6 construction costs are not factored in. So in this scenario, the rates that you'd be putting together, I assume, 
would reflect what's needed to bring in an additional 3.5 million in the first year. And we're right now at 5 million, mm -hmm. five and a half million. Mm -hmm. So that's a 50 to 55 percent increase, the way I understand it. Alex is uh, probably going to tell me it's not quite that easy. But and in, then in the second scenario, is the phased approach. So we still have to pay the loan back, but I don't think that we're going to be spending the 1.6 million. Um, the CIP funding is starting at a million. I'm going up to 2.5 million in the fifth year. We could always go up to 2.5 million in the seventh year, um, or just get to 2 million in the fifth year. The additional reserves is phased in. The additional recharge goes from an additional 250 to an additional 500 acre feet. But again, the totals on the right hand side and the numbers that Alex is working with that are going to be coming back to us until, unless we tell him differently, um, they're going to reflect 1.8 million, 2.3 million, and 2.7 million going up. And that's, I don't know, a 40% increase. <coughs> And then there's the Chrome 6 construction loan. I guess I need to push this button. Oh, now what have I done? <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right. So um, that's the phased-in approach, plus adding in the Chromium 6 construction loan. That, that would be taken out. This is a $5 million grant, $2 million loan. Okay. So that's just a number that we were using when we put this little chart together. We need to update that number. Um, so, the state has stated, the state has <laughs> said, said <laughs> that, and this was in June, it's going to be 18 to 24 months before they come up with a new MCL. Mm -hmm. Now, if we make the assumption, so let's say it's two years. So that's June of 2019, right? Um, we're going to make the assumption that they're going to give us three, give the MCL, the districts that have the MCL problem three years. That's 2022. These rate studies, this rate study is only for the next five years, 2018 through 2023. So it could be that we for this rate study, we don't <coughs> calculate in those costs, but I sort of look at it as, you know, in uh, 10 years, my grandson is going to college, and I'm putting <laughs> away money mm -hmm. so that 10 years from now, he can go to college. Now, if he happens to decide to father, follow his father and join the Army, then they'll pay for his college, and I'll still have that money. So. 10 years down the road, I could have some extra money to use for something else, but I've got it planned for. So five, six, seven years down the road, when the state tells us you have to be compliant, we've been putting a little bit of money away, and if we haven't done that, then when the state tells us you have to be compliant, the next rate increase is going to have to take care of five to ten million dollars worth of costs. Okay, so those are the three scenarios. So, so when Alex was running through the presentation, and he was talking about uh, chromium-6 treatment, long-term water supply, and capital improvement needs. Those are the numbers that he currently has. And those numbers came from Susan and Randy and I sitting down one day when nothing was going on and, <laughs> and coming up with some numbers. So. The CAC is going to have to discuss that. The board's going to have to discuss it. But the numbers are going to come back with do everything at once, phase it in, and phase it in and plan for chromium six costs. Unless there's some other scenarios, and then when they come back, then we'll start tweaking it. Mm -hmm. Alex? Yeah, I think that's a good to come back with you know a few options like that because it might be easier than just you know talking generically when you can yeah. see some real numbers. Yeah. You can bounce off of stuff. Wait a minute, we don't like that there. It's, can we do it differently? So having something a little more concrete mm -hmm. to react against, I think, is, is helpful for 
for everybody. So at least that'll be a starting, starting place. Point, yeah. So I have a couple questions for Alex. Yes, just, and I'm just going to ask your opinion because if can we go back to Alex's presentation? Keith, you're supposed to be listening to me, Keith. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Why? Why start now? Uh, <laughs> All right, so uh, slide 12. 12. <clears throat> okay, when I look at this graph, what stands out to me is if the board in 1996 and the successive boards had just said, okay, you know what, three percent. That's about that's about all we can afford. We're a disadvantaged community. There's inflation, etc. Our average water bill now would be about seventy-three dollars. Hmm. Okay, it's kind of a gradual three percent. You know, if I get a three percent return from the bank in the next decade or two, that would be acceptable. So. But we didn't. We uh, we did a 1.5, 1.7 percent over those 20 years, with uh, forget the numbers, but four or five years of six percent, two mm -hmm. years of zero percent. So it bounced around because we were trying to keep up. Wouldn't it? And this is just an opinion. Wouldn't it make more sense to to have a consistent uh, rate? Mm -hmm with the intent of, of getting there in five years and then keeping it and uh, rather than you know 40 percent this year and then 40 percent the next year and then oh we've well, something else happened and now we're going to drop it to 20 percent and then chromium six comes and oh now we have to go to 60 percent yeah doesn't the public more readily accept a an increase that's consistent I think so, yeah. I, I, people prefer, in general, the gradual step up in rates rather than no rate increases followed by a big rate spike at the end. Um, and I think that was kind of the intent in some of these prior studies was to say, hey, we are looking out long term. That's why, you know, even the rates may be only be for five years, we like to make the projections looking out 10 years because there may be stuff hovering out there like the Chrome 6 or, or who knows what or, you know, that we want to factor in. And, at least look a little bit longer term. The whole goal is, I mean, I think in the ideal world that you can do it and, you know, you look long term and we can set course and gradually move on that course and, per we, you know, it's, after five years it's not the end. You know, it looks like we have to go further, but you kind of reevaluate and adjust course as needed. Maybe it needs to be a little higher, a little bit less. So I think that was kind of the intent last time and uh, even the prior time with, <coughs> hey, let's aim for 6% rate increases that seem to be within the realm of what's tolerable and it's going to move our finances in the right direction. But you don't always have perfect knowledge. Even us doing this rate study is a lot of guessing games as to, you know, what, who knows what the chromium six may be. What's Mojave Water Aid, what's the state water project rate going to be five years down the line? Well, we could assume some gradual increase, but if they're going to be doing the big um, peripheral canal tunnels and renegotiating all the contracts, Maybe it's a lot more. So there's always unknowns, but I agree with you. Yeah, it's nice if you could look long term and have like a steady flight path towards meeting the needs, and maybe you have to adjust a little bit. Um, and you've do, you've done that to some degree over the last ten years. You know, you had sixes maybe deferred a few years, and you had you know a, a group of seven percent last time. So I think that may be one of the goals coming out of this is what it, but then again you're, you're facing certain needs and there are occasions where agencies can't afford to do the gradual I've certainly worked with a lot of agencies and wait a minute we have to build a new treatment plant in the next five years we can't phase in gradual rates we need to get our rates up tomorrow by a lot um, hopefully you're not in that situation we haven't you know we started making some background projections and going through the water use data and coming up with some analysis. Um, there still needs to be a little more honing on our level and working with staff to make sure we've got all the right numbers in there. 
they could be presented to you guys to, to show you what you know if the first cut looks like under these maybe these first few scenarios or if there's other basic scenarios we start with but I think that's definitely a, a, um, a good way to go if you if it can work right. but it also means you might not as you're gradually increasing rates you're not going to have 2.5 million next year for capital needs so it also means you're you're not going to get there tomorrow but you're going to be aiming to get there over the longer term but that's that's a good way to go if you, if you can do it so i don't mean to imply that i think the rate should be three percent but um something consistent and i think the board and the cac are looking at the same thing and the, i think the last question i have for alex is if if we're down 10 percent or 20 percent revenues because of conservation and now it's a habit how do we adjust the rate structure um, to recoup that revenue? I've heard lots of newspaper articles, read, read articles, heard people talking about, well, our water district conserved 30%, but now our rates are going up. We still have the fixed costs. You're exactly right. You know, with this district, a lot of the costs are fixed costs. So if you have to collect a million dollars and you're selling a million units of water, it's a dollar a unit. But if that now goes down to 800 units of water. Maybe it's not a million. Maybe it's 999,000 because you saved a little bit of electricity costs. You know, the rate per unit needs to be a little bit higher. Um, but I think typically what we do going into something like this is try to come up with what we think is a slightly conservative estimate of water demand going forward. Um, so if it's not going to be exactly the level it was before, maybe we assume it was you know kind of what it was last year. So that'll be factored into how much revenues you're getting and what the rates are. There is something that you just mentioned there that gets brought up some places. Hey, we conserved, but now you're raising our rates. No fair. Because um, some agencies, they did conserve. They had to raise rates to recoup the fixed costs. But the other flip side of the coin is that for anyone who conserved, they're not buying 10 units of water. They're only buying eight. So. <coughs> Yeah, the rate needs to be higher to recoup the same level of revenues, but they're only buying eight units instead of ten. They're, they're not. Their bill didn't go up. All of the things held equal. And their bill is going to be lower, certainly, than it would have if they didn't conserve. Um, but that's just reality. And th for this district, that conservation wasn't a 40% swing. Again, it was you know, down about 17% and you know, kind of a little bounce back. So you're 10% lower than where you were a few years ago. And maybe that's, you know, going into this, we try to put assumptions into the rate study that are not overly rosy. We try to, you know, be a little on the conservative side, not assuming that water's gonna spike back up and you're gonna get all this uh, mythical revenues that may never be there, then find yourself two years down, down the line that, whoops, we're, we uh, didn't do any rate increases because we thought we we're gonna get all this magical revenues coming in, find yourself in the hole. but. I think in the planning process, try to come up with estimates that are a little on the conservative side is the way to address that. And you could still, I mean, it still doesn't have, it, if an agency loses a lot of revenues because their water sales go down, doesn't mean they have to, you know, change the rates overnight to get it, but that could be part of the long-term plan. Where do we need to go under our new levels of water demand to fund what we need to fund? And for the rates, I don't know if you need to change your rate structure at all because just the rates changed a little bit, um, but it's not like oh we have to change tier two now goes to 9.3 units and you know I don't think there there doesn't need to be any change to the rate structure to address that maybe that's just part of the overall you know where the rates need to go so instead of needing eight percent you might need nine percent I'm just making up numbers to account for the fact that the water sales are a little bit lower. Okay, thank you. Any final things for Alex? Yes, Kathleen. Um, why do we go through this punishment every five years? Is five a magic number or something? <laughs> uh, you know, good question. Typically, when agencies do rates, they can adopt anywhere from one year to five years. Sometimes, on rare occasion, we see an agency go more than that. Uh, but typically, that's considered like a reasonable level for planning horizon that agencies are comfortable adopting rates for. There's only one agency I'm thinking of that did more than five years, and that was Palm Springs. Their sewer rate used to be like $10 per month, 
and it needed to go to you know much higher and they were afraid of raising rates so they you know a few years they did nothing then finally they adopted like a 20-year rate increase where I think it went up like a you know a few bucks five bucks maybe over the first couple of years and it was a dollar a year every year or something like that but the reason is because you, you have to notice the rate payers you can't exceed the rates that are done through the prop 218 process if you want to look at potentially adopting even a longer term rate increase that can be discussed there may be some legal issues with that some attorneys aren't comfortable with more than five but um, some agencies only do it a year at a time so they're pulling teeth every year <laughs> and they keep saying well we don't have perfect information so we'll do one year nobody has never has perfect information but you can get some good picture sense of where you need to go and I can tell you the rates you adopt over the next five years again those are just steps on the path there's other stuff going to be in the future whether it's cost inflation or or chrome six so that's why you've done probably this is like the generally considered the maximum amount of time you can do so you don't have to keep coming back every year or every other year every few years yeah. well and i think if you go further out i mean you know get out your crystal ball we're already exactly. doing a lot of that yeah. the longer you go out you know the less reliable that information is and so I think it gets really questionable further out <clears throat> okay if there's nothing else thank you very much Alice we look forward to being joined at the hip for the next oh, yes. couple yeah. months <laughs> and working with both the CAC and the board you do a great job oh, really thank you, thank thank you. Very much. Thank you Okay, with that, we will go to the district council. Uh, oh, okay. Mr. No, special. I did note that the Little Hoodlum Commission did come out with a report a couple of weeks ago. I read it. With, I haven't completed my review yet, but I did read the 20 recommendations. What I gleaned out of it with my most clever covered classes was they're uh, complimentary of special districts and they appreciate the service they render at the local level. Glad to see that in the yeah, report. I think, that's a, I think that's a fair uh, observation. And it's a. It, uh, 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 it's a reminder that you're a creature. We're a creature of statute, Joshua Basin Water District. We're what? A creature of statute. Mm -hmm. The legislature formed us. They have the power to dissolve us. They have the power to. They have plenary power. Can, and it's it, and it's really important. Bye, Ellie. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye. 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 <laughs> it's just a friendly reminder Bye. that uh, you are a creature of statute. Uh, so all these inconveniences, like Prop 28, whatever, uh, they're necessary. And if you don't abide by him, uh, your very existence is threatened. And uh, again, I, I, I really like the fact that the commission in general, generally speaking, really appreciates the service that special districts render, such as Joshua Basin Water District. And that's a renewed appreciation. It's things, services like that that are so important to everybody. They're best governed at the local level mm -hmm. and not in Sacramento. And I think they acknowledge that. I have, I'll read it some more, but I haven't completed my reading of it, but that's my initial observation. Yeah, I like that too, that the, the problems are best solved at the local level. Mm -hmm. All right, so general manager report. I have no general manager's report, but I wanted to say our, our legal counsel wanted you to know that we're creatures of statute. <laughs> and I think that I we're creatures it. of stature. <laughs> <laughs> and so is the statue CAC statue. and so is the public. <laughs> Sarah, don't get me. Thank you so much. I have, a, I have a question for the general manager. Yes, sir. Just curious about Well 14. Yeah, what, I'm what curious. What the latest is. <laughs> 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 <Here you are. laughs> Just briefly what the latest is. Uh, the latest is, uh, let's see, this is what? This is uh, Tuesday. So last week on Monday and Tuesday, on Tuesday and Wednesday, we ran nine step samples. The first day came back with uh, eight absence and one present. And the HPCs were uh, remarkably low after having set for 12 days. And then we ran uh, tests, the same nine steps test on uh, the following day and there were four presents and five absences. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, we have been meeting with uh, DUDEC and their hydrogeologists, um, our staff, uh, Bill and Steve and Randy Little have been doing uh, extraordinary work. 
we're putting together a uh, protocol um, for uh, doing a dynamic flow test, which uh, we don't have to do a static because we, it's current enough, but the dynamic flow test, the dynamic flow in the well changes when you uh, clean the casing. Uh, the uh, louvers are more open, so we need to know where the waters are coming in. Um, we are meeting on Thursday with uh, Michael Sneeders of uh, Kansas. He's in Kansas. Mm -hmm. He's a uh, uh, certainly national, and we had to wait to set up the meeting so that he could get back from Columbia mm. and is used uh, on uh, problem wells. Mm -hmm. And uh, he will be uh, working with uh, uh, Dudek on the protocol, and we're also uh, going to be using another company to come in and do the dynamic profile and collect samples. And in fact, today we collected samples from Michael Schneider's uh, to be sent to his lab in Kansas for a full analysis of uh, dissolved solids and all kinds of three-letter acronyms <laughs> that I threatened Randy with turning to him and asking what they stood for. <laughs> so we, we're going to be speciating the bacteria, mm. and we're trying to determine where the food source is, and um, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we don't have the estimated costs firmed up yet, but I imagine they're going to be someplace around $40,000. Hmm. And uh, hopefully that will tell us what the problem is, and uh, we can fix it. And at the same time, Randy's been working with the Division of Drinking Water on some process called Four Log, uh, which allows you to put the well back online, but it has to be run through a, s a system of pipes and or retention uh, tanks hmm. to ex expand the uh, contact time for the chlorination, mm -hmm. and then it, it can be used in Division of Drinking Water is working on those calculations, and um, we'll have them to us shortly. So we're still hopeful, but we are quite frustrated. Thank you, and thanks for the good work, everybody. Yeah. All right. Ready to move on to item number 10, the director reports on meetings attended, comments, and future agenda items. Um, I went to the Mojave Water Agency meeting on August 24th. They are starting to look at um, state water project and all of that, but it was very preliminary, and then they went into closed session, and I left at that point. Um, Finance Committee. We went through all of the paperwork. Come to them. There's so much fun. <laughs> and you saw that tonight because some of that stuff is the stuff we had. Water op resource and operations. Did we have a meeting? We did not. I didn't think so. And then public outreach consultant. That would be Kathleen. The public information committee did not meet as well but a lot goes on regardless of a meeting. And just so everyone's aware, this is National Emergency Preparedness Month, <laughs> and <laughs> the rest of the country is testing their <laughs> preparedness. Sure Please, are. everyone, we are certainly not immune, <clears throat> and if you're looking for what to do to be ready for a water emergency, our booth at the Farmer's Market will walk you through everything. It rained on Saturday when we were there, and I was surprised people still wanted to take a cup and get it out of our dispenser instead of standing there and collecting it in the rain for free. <laughs> they like our service. October 26th, we will have a classroom rendition of Water School 101 here in the boardroom. It will be at 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. I walk the students through it. However, you're still welcome to participate in the program online at your own convenience. And then moving into um, October, a heads up, 
On October 10th, we are sponsoring, along with Mojave Water Agency and the Alliance for Water Awareness and Conservation, the Town of Yucca Valley and Green Media Consortium, or whatever they are. We'll be putting together a winterizing class. It's free. There's limited seating. It will be at the Town of Yucca Valley's Choya Room. It is open to all water district customers. So I'm giving you, you know, the first heads up. We are the lead on it, so you'll be hearing more about it. But if you want to attend, it's a two-hour seminar on Tuesday night from 5.30 to 7.30. And quite frankly, <coughs> if you've ever had a broken pipe, you know you wish you'd spent pennies to fix it beforehand because the damage it does, usually the average, according to insurance companies, is $1,500 to $9,000 is what mm -hmm. their general claims are for the damage caused by a broken pipe when it would have only cost you a few dollars. So if you want to learn how to do it for free, we're arranging this course on how to winterize your home, and I'll have more information. In fact, I have flyers. I'll stick them out here. And that's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Kathleen, uh, people that want to attend that, will there be like a sign up for it? You have, yeah. I do have a flyer here. This is digitally going out to all the water districts. As I said, I'll have it out here. But yes, you would contact me, and it's the first 35 people, and we cut it off. So all the water districts will only do 35 people. And it's hands on. So it's a pretty good class. Okay. Thank you. Okay, future director meetings and training opportunities. The Mojave meeting on the 14th with Director Unger. Finance committee will be on the 25th, and that's Vice President Johnson and Director Flom. Water Resources and Operations is the 25th following that at 10 a.m., and that is me and Vice President Johnson. And the Mojave Water Agency Technical Advisory Committee meeting is October 5th and I'm going to that. And if anybody else is interested, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, with that, Director's comments? Else? Director's oh. reports on meetings attended and comments and future agenda items. Oh, I just went through that. Well, let's start with Director Comments. We'll start with Director Flum. Uh, quite a few of us went over to the um, um, California Special District Association uh, uh, what was a workshop, I suppose you'd call it, seminar or whatever, on uh, the Ralph M. Brown Act. That's the open meeting law. There's some nuances to that, but we had um, from the uh, Joshua Basin Water District, we had a very good turnout there for that. Um, that's all. Thank you. Director Hunt. No comments. Okay. Yeah, I was also at the uh, Brown Act uh, workshop. It was really good, and I wish these were open to the general public. It's, there was about 36 people there, and, uh, and we have definitely complied with the Brown Act in spirit and in letter. Uh, three directors went. We did not go in the same car. We did not sit by each other. We did not discuss anything about the water district while we were there. Um, but people were there from our health care district, um, from uh, Rongo Valley Community Services uh, District, so it was a wide range of people, and then other people from different, you know, administrative positions and different kinds of special. It was really good, and we got, you know, great materials here to take home, and and uh, was 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 really good. And I just would like to thank the CAC and uh, and Kathleen. You guys are are really our front line as we come up to this rate process. You have all been doing a great job with public outreach on this. Uh, the newsletters always are have good information. The booth at the farmer's market, uh, getting this out to people, why it's necessary. And it is. it does have to do with our infrastructure. And and it's it's their water. It's, it's the people's water system. We have to take care of it. And when you think, you know, planning out, you know, five years, my gosh, back in 2013, I don't think we had announced the drought then. We didn't, I think we were just starting to hear about Chrome 6, but anything can happen. And, uh, you know, it's, we, we need to do this. We need to be prepared for it. 
And I thank you guys so much for all this advanced work on it. The work you're doing with the public is so valuable, and it's so necessary, and it's so meaningful. And it's not just because Tom and I have to run on a rate increase next year, <laughs> but I, <laughs> but I, but I think that you guys are are doing a, a absolutely fantastic funny. job. And thank you so much for <laughs> to CAC for being a part of this meeting. I'm I'm glad you were comfortable. I didn't want you to think we were subsuming you or something like that. So thank you very much. And um, and yeah, Kurt, as, as uh, Alex was talking, I was making notes. Potential compliance fund, and. Even if it's not Chrome 6, what next? It will be something. And if we start to look at, you know, putting that away, uh, it's, it's really important, too. Yep. Thank you for all your hard work, too. Okay. <laughs> and thank you to the advisory committee. Thank you so much for being here and everything you do. Karen, you do a great job of leading it. And um, I, it has a very warm spot in my heart because that's where I started, was on the CAC, was on that for a while. So love you guys. Um, you do a great job. And if there's nothing else, do I have a motion for adjournment? I move that we adjourn. Do a second? I'll second that. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 We are adjourned. See you in our next meeting, whenever the, that is. Oops. Is it next week? We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs>